The most powerful neurotransmitter in the world is a neurotransmitter that can turn your brain off. It's like the off switch. And I don't mean entirely lights out off. Okay, but we have to look at the two really powerful neurotransmitters that influence whether we are on or whether we are off. You know those days when you just feel amped up. You can't really explain why. It's not anxious, it's, it's just, you're almost excitable, but it's not necessarily in a good way. And then you have the days where you feel like slow is smooth, smooth is fast. You're able to articulate, it's like your brain isn't moving so fast that you're, well, what I'm describing here is the balance between GABA and glutamate. Two ridiculously important, critical neurotransmitters and they are so important when it comes down to just how we function and how we think clearly and even how we perform in the gym, believe it or not. GABA is what we call an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which means, for lack of a better way of saying it, it sort of inhibits or shuts things off. It helps shut down, whereas a glutamate is excitatory. And I'll give you an example so it makes sense here. If you've ever heard of MSG before, MSG put it in good tasting food to make things taste better. The idea behind MSG is it's monosodium glutamate. It increases glutamate in your brain. So it makes you feel a little bit better. You eat that food and it feels exciting and you get almost a better visceral response from the food because you're messing with neurotransmission a little bit. That gives you an idea of how glutamate works at a very sort of subtle level, whereas GABA is that state where you're calm. So the point is, how do we influence GABA? How do we make it so that we are more GABAergic? How do we be more GABA-centric so that we can be calm, collected? I don't think there's anyone out there that doesn't want to be calm, cool, and collected. Now, if we put it like this, there are a lot of mental disorders that are GABA-centric, right? We look at anxiety, even things like schizophrenia, these are GABA issues, GABA disorders. It just goes to show how important GABA is when it comes down to it. Now, we have GABA receptors in our prefrontal cortex, we have them in our hippocampus, we have them in our hypothalamus, we have them even in our uh, spinal cord. Like, they're all over, even in our enteric nervous system. So let's cut right to the chase. How can you influence GABA? And more importantly, do GABA supplements actually work? First off, there was a study published in Frontiers in Neuroscience. It took a look at 14 studies. This was a systematic review. And this systematic review only looked at placebo-controlled human trials. So it was really good. I'm just going to read you a quote from the study. There is limited evidence for stress and very limited evidence for sleep with oral GABA intake. We know that GABA is critical for stress and critical for sleep. So if oral supplementation was working, it would have improved sleep and it would have improved stress. And we didn't see that in really any of these 14 human placebo controlled studies. So that essentially tells us that we have a problem with absorbing GABA when it's taken in supplement form. But what gets kind of interesting is if you know about GABAergic drugs, like pharmaceuticals, you know that they're a real thing. Like we utilize GABA receptors, we influence GABA in the pharmaceutical world, but how are they doing it? Well, there's three real ways that pharmaceuticals are working in this. They're using what are called positive allosteric modulators. This is where you're sort of increasing GABA sensitivity. So you're increasing the receptor sensitivity. Now essentially what I wanna tell you in this video is how we can do this and get an influence on GABA so we're more relaxed and calm and can sleep better and can, you know, all these things, right? Okay, so that's how a positive allosteric modulator works. Then there are what are called reuptake inhibitors. This basically makes it so that the GABA stays on its receptor, in its receptor for longer, which basically increases the act of GABA. And finally, there are GABA agonists, which directly activate the GABA receptor. Now these all come with their own pros and cons, right? But we're not talking about how to use those, we're talking about how to do this via either supplementation, food, and lifestyle. The thing that we're starting to realize is that GABA may not cross the blood-brain barrier. Because if it did, even in the pharmaceutical world, we would be using these more. We would be using direct analogs, which would be carbon copies like synthetic GABA. And clearly we're not using those as the primary driver to influence GABA, so 
we have to kind of understand that maybe this is not crossing the blood-brain barrier. If we look back at the early studies, like 1950 studies, there was evidence that suggested they don't cross the blood-brain barrier, they don't have an impact. That was old stuff in the journal Neurochemistry, and it was pretty clear, like, okay, GABA doesn't work. And then 1988, they did more research on this with better technology, and they found, okay, still doesn't seem as though GABA crosses the blood-brain barrier. Blood-brain barrier kind of protects the brain uh, from things that shouldn't go in it, larger molecules, et cetera, et cetera. Then in 2002, there was a study done in rats, and just prior to that, there was a study done in dogs. And in these studies, they found that when they injected GABA, they were able to find amounts of GABA in the cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, so this was indicating that the GABA was crossing the blood-brain barrier. But what was really intriguing about these papers, especially the latter, the rodent paper, is that when they injected GABA, there was a 33% increase in GABA ultimately in the brain or cerebral spinal fluid. But when they combined it with L-arginine, simple amino acid, it went up 65%. So this opened up a whole new can of worms. Mechanistically, they're assuming that the arginine being a precursor to NO2, or nitric oxide in this case, nitric oxide is a vasodilator increasing blood flow to the brain. So probably, probably what was happening was there was an increase in blood flow which allowed for more GABA that ordinarily wouldn't get through to get in. But this is in rats and dogs. We have not seen this replicated in humans. Don't know why, but sometimes that's the way that it works. So we cannot say yes or no, GABA supplements get into the brain, but what we do know is that potentially you need a lot. And there is one other study published in Frontiers in Psychology that helped us understand this more and why it might be working this way. This was utilizing what's called the enteric nervous system. The enteric nervous system is the nervous system that's in our gut. It's not our brain. It's the other stuff, right? It's the nervous system in our gut that communicates with the brain. What they found in this study is that there could be an indirect relationship between GABA on the enteric nervous system and then communicating via the vagal nerve to the brain to influence GABA. So now we see that GABA supplementation may have an impact on GABA in the brain, but it's by happening through an indirect mechanism, which would potentially require a pretty high dose of GABA. So what you might be gathering from this is if you want the effects of being able to sleep, if you want the GABA supplementation directly is probably not the best way. So there's some better ways to do it. And I'm gonna start with the simple basic things first. Okay, first and foremost, alcohol. Alcohol, the reason you feel so calm and sedated and cool and rico suave and, is because of the influence on GABA, okay? You're, you're in a very GABAergic influence and you're feeling calm and cool. But it happens so much that you actually downregulate GABA in the first place. There was a study published in NeuroImage, took a look at 52 heavy drinkers versus 49 light drinkers. They found that the heavy drinkers had significantly lower levels of GABA in the brain. It had ultimately downregulated. It had desensitized to GABA. Probably the last thing you want to have happen. And what they found is that on the counter, there was a hyperexcitability. So there was a hyperexcitability that led people to feel just amped up. It's almost why an alcoholic might feel like they're just so antsy until they drink. It calms them down. They need it because it disrupted their natural kind of balance of it. Now, the other piece, this is an interesting one, is specific kinds of exercise increase GABA. There's a study published in Journal Neuroscience found that if you're at an 80% of your maximum heart rate range, so pretty high intensity for like 15, 20 minutes, they used magnetic resonance spectrometry. So they actually looked at the brain and they could see that it was influencing increasing GABA after exercise. And it would come back down to baseline, but eventually it was finding that this was becoming like almost habitual. Like it was becoming like the body would anticipate it, the brain would anticipate it, making baseline GABA levels a little bit higher, especially in people that chronically exercise and get their heart rate nice and high. So the rule of thumb here is if you're exercising, you do need to get your heart rate high. You can't just go lift, lift weights and pump iron. Like, I love that stuff, but you gotta get that heart rate high if you want the mental effect, and you want the sleep effect, and you want the stress effect, right? It's important, it doesn't need to be crazy high intensity. Now let's talk supplementation, then I've got some foods. Okay, so we know GABA supplementation doesn't really work, but what about using ways to influence GABA? One of the most powerful GABAergic compound or amplifier, which is kind of the word I wanna use, it amplifies how GABA is received and used. So even if your GABA levels are low, it might 
amplify those low levels so that they do a little bit better, is kava. Kava is miraculous in this case. I, I use it personally. It helps me sleep. It keeps me calm. I use it before I go to the airport, things like that. Kava is one of those positive allosteric modulators, which means it binds to a slightly different receptor site on the GABA receptor, but that actually increases the binding potential for GABA itself. It's kind of complicated how that works, but basically by bringing in something that binds to a slightly different, you have multiple GABA receptors, alpha, beta, yada, yada. And this binds to a different receptor which draws the, the real GABA in. So it's a positive allosteric modulator. So it actually amplifies the GABA that you do have circulating around, not directly influencing GABA, but amplifies how it works. There's a study published in PLOS1 that found that kava lactones, which are the active compound, if you want to call it that, in kava, directly have an impact directly influence GABA receptors. So we do know something is going on there. And then there was another study published in Food Standards that found that kava does seem to cross through the blood-brain barrier. The kava metabolites do seem to cross through the blood-brain barrier. This is really powerful stuff because kava has long been talked about as an alternative to alcohol. It can influence GABA without actually bombarding the brain with GABA. Okay, so kava is a great one. But if you combine kava with something else, there's something called nicotinyl GABA. Okay, and all it is is a GABA molecule or a GABA analog along with B3, niacin. What this potentially does and seems to work, and personally I have experimented with it, and it works phenomenally well. When you bind the GABA with the B3, it can cross through the blood-brain barrier, sort of bottlenecks it in a way. And it unlocks. So once it gets through the blood-brain barrier, the GABA and the niacin separate. Niacin goes through and actually increases blood flow to the brain, and now the GABA is liberated in the brain, potentially binding to the GABA receptor better. But you have it combined with the kava, which is actually increasing the affinity for the GABA to the receptor anyway. So you have potentially GABA entering the brain, then you have kava influencing how that GABA sticks, which is really powerful stuff. And then once you have the niacin vasodilating, you have other positive effects, uh, blood flow to the brain, yada, yada. Then there was some interesting mechanistic research done in journal Nutrition and found that additionally, GABA and B3, nicotinoidal GABA, together actually have a positive impact on substrate utilization by the mitochondria as well. So basically the mitochondria use fuel better. So there's a potential metabolic impact that might make you feel calm and relaxed. I put a link down below for a really interesting company called Troscriptions. If you've seen my videos before with Dr. Scott Schur, he's a very interesting guy, and he's an MD, he's, he's just awesome. He had formulated this product, and it's called TroCalm, and it used, they're called Tro because they use what are called trochees. Okay, trochees spells in, spelled interesting, like T-R-O-C-H-E-S. Trochees, they go in your gum, and you put them in your gum and your teeth, okay? And when you do this, you're not having the compounds disrupted by the gut microbiome, by the hostility of the hydrochloric acid and whatnot. You're actually absorbing much better. And there's a lot of evidence to support that trochees absorb significantly better than when it goes into the gut. Now, what's interesting is they utilize these compounds. They use kava, okay, and they use the unique form of nicotinoidal GABA. Now, because of their unique delivery, and you can break it, it comes in these little four square things. And you can break off one little square, you can break off two little squares, or all four. So what I'll do is I'll stick one in my gum, and I'll use that like as I'm going through TSA, when I know I'm gonna get frazzled. By the time I'm on the plane, I'm like, goose fraba, super calm. Personally, my anecdotal experience with Trocom, this stuff is the only supplement that has ever had an impact on my level of anxiousness. I've had other things, I've tried other things. Lifestyle things have the biggest impact. My exercise, my meditation, my sauna, by far. But as far as a supplement that I can utilize, and the absorption is great. So I'm getting an effect in like 15, 20 minutes. I went ahead, they have sponsored some content on my channel, they are great people. I know Dr. Scott, he is awesome. That link down below, top line of the description, using code TD10 is a 10% off discount link. It's pretty darn cool because they have figured out how to potentially get GABA or at least the GABAergic activity in the brain the way that we want it. Sleep, potential stress, feeling flustered, tilting yourself back to the calmer state. Now let's talk about how you can use that along with certain foods that increase GABA, okay? Because GABA we can find in foods too. 
But the problem is oral, oral utilization of GABA probably isn't that good. But if we can increase the affinity for GABA, then we can improve that, right? Now, first off, meditation. There's a study published in Brain Stimulation that found that non-regular meditators compared to meditators that, that would actually meditate regularly, they found that when they put both groups into a meditation practice, people that didn't regularly meditate and people that do regularly meditate, the people that do regularly meditate had a 27% increase in cerebral spinal fluid. Now, that is directly correlated with GABA. CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, and GABA work kind of hand in hand in some way. So when you see the, the bottom line with that is that people that are regular meditators got an impact from meditation, whereas people that were not regular did not. So you got to be consistent with it. Now let's talk foods. First off, fermented foods, very powerful. Kimchi, sauerkraut, those kinds of things. Fermented milk, cottage cheese, yogurt. Impact on the gut, it is hypothesized that some of our GABA is produced in the gut possibly as well. Okay, so that is a little bit speculative, but I do wanna say that fermented foods and taking care of the gut have a huge impact on the enteric nervous system that could be allowing that communication of GABA to the brain. So increasing those foods made a big difference in my life. Shrimp and halibut are two of the most GABA-rich foods that you can consume. Okay, so eating shrimp and halibut not necessarily regularly, but somewhat consistently, could be good for your GABA levels, especially if you're taking them in tandem with something like Trocalm, or you're taking even just straight kava, or just a good healthy lifestyle. So shrimp and halibut, I would say once a week could be really good. Cocoa is also really good. Some of the effects of cocoa in making you feel calm, that's probably from the GABA influence there. Cocoa is calming. Even though there's theobromine and a smidge of caffeine, it is powerful for calming effects. So like a tablespoon mixed with maybe like a little bit of hot milk or something like that, you might notice a big difference, even if it's before sleep. One that people don't talk about a lot because fava beans are really cool is various beans, but fava beans specifically. Okay, fava beans not only have GABA in them, they also have L-DOPA. Okay, so you get a dopamine precursor and GABA. Whether or not those can get through the bloodstream or through the blood-brain barrier, that's a little bit to be up for debate. But we do know that if you were to consume it with some protein, like with like arginine or straight up L-arginine, you can increase how that could get through the bloodstream. So the L-dopa, so you get that good feeling, the GABA, so you get that calm feeling, along with maybe some L-arginine, that could be a good little compound. You could just mix some fava beans, have a little scoop of arginine, or again, if you're using trocalm, like you could use that and the fava could influence GABA production even more because it contains GABA. And if it binds to the site, then heck yeah. Now, one that people will tell you, it's very high in GABA is spinach. I do not recommend that you eat raw spinach. Oxalates are a real thing. I don't avoid vegetables. You can't avoid oxalates. They're gonna end up in your life. But what gives spinach the grittiness, that grittiness is pure oxalate crystals. We do not clear those. The oxalates that we take in, they are there. And those can develop and form microcrystals in the kidneys, they can form crystals in our joints. It is a real thing, okay? I had uh, Dr. Jacob Torres, a uh, doctor at a University of California, Santa Barbara, and he was talking to me about this. I was so surprised to hear an actual PhD say, no, like oxalates, are, that's a real problem. Okay, so I do not recommend the raw spinach. If you must have the spinach, cook it, but I would prefer you go for something like arugula. But anyway, just don't let people influence you to consume spinach as your source of GABA. I would recommend you go with fava beans or shrimp and halibut. Tomatoes, another one, and you can get this straight from the tomato sauce too. Right, so tomato sauce, definitely a good source of GABA. I would, usually what I would do is make like a bolognese with like some ground chicken or some ground beef with some tomato sauce. I don't usually eat straight up raw tomatoes, but I love cooked or stewed tomatoes or tomato sauce, so that's a great meal right there. The big important takeaways from this, kava instead of alcohol, and if you do drink alcohol, reduce it. It is dose dependent, the more you reduce your alcohol, the better your GABA is going to be. You are not going to be as downregulated. Okay, lifestyle matters. Sauna, exercise, getting your heart rate up over 80% of your max heart rate. Find out what your max heart rate is. Okay, do the math, do the Harris Benedict formula, do all kinds of stuff. You can take, uh, you know, 220 minus your age is another good one to figure out what your max heart rate probably is. That's usually pretty solid and get yourself up to that 80% of that max heart rate a couple times per week and watch what that does to your calm sense of being. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. Don't forget to check out those trochies from Trocalm Troscriptions down below in the top line of the description. I'll see you tomorrow.